Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, my parents are currently brush hogging and mowing um, their large 40 acre farm. So if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, but I had a couple of requests from people. Um, I did a wilderness first aid live on Instagram and I had a bunch of people want me to go live on here so that way um, my YouTube audience could watch. So I just kind of want to go over a real quick um, wilderness first aid. Firstly, I want to mention that this is not affiliated with any organization, any wilderness first aid class. Um, and I being just a registered nurse, this is simply just some things that I picked up along the way. This is no certification or affiliated with anything professional. Um, and the information you receive here, you know, do your own research folks, but I just want to come on here and kind of give you some things that I know um, as an emergency medicine nurse and things that I've learned from other people. So I want to just do like a quick review on wilderness first aid. We're going to start at the most important for me, like CPR, bleeding, life-saving techniques. And then we're going to work our way down through severity to like insect bites, burns, ticks, and stuff like that. So bear with me. Um, and hopefully, you know, if anyone has any questions, I'll be able to see those on here and answer them for you. If not, I'll try to answer them all at the end. Okay. So first we're going to start with um, wilderness first aid. First aid is, is uh, aimed at preserving life, preventing further harm, and promoting recovery. That being said, um, there are certain places that we always want to start uh, when it comes to any type of um, coming along onto the scene of something, um, if a trauma or an accident or something like that. Um, so the first thing you're going to do when you come across anything that could be traumatic or um, anything that you see where somebody might be unconscious, um, not bleeding or whatever, is assess the scene for safety. Um, so if you walk into a scene that is not safe and you end up getting hurt, now you're creating twice as much work for first responders. So always make sure that the scene is safe. Look around for wild animals, um, falling debris, flash flood, anything like that, wildfires that you know could also cause harm to you. Um, that being said, the first thing we always assess and like one of the first things we learn in nursing school is the ABCs. So that is airway, breathing, and circulation. After you've assessed the scene and make sure that it is safe, you enter the scene and you make sure that that person has an airway. Are they talking? Are they coughing? Um, are they communicating with you? That's a good sign. If they're not, then we move on to B. B is breathing. We're gonna check for their rise and the fall in the chest. We're gonna check for, you know, breathing sounds. Um, we're gonna maybe put our hand under there. Um, you can also put your ear on the chest just to kind of, if you can't really see, it also help you make sure that that person is breathing. If they're breathing, that is good. If they're not breathing, we move on to C, which is the third step, which is circulation. Do they have a pulse? Um, if I cannot feel a pulse here on the forearm or on the carotid um, or on the femoral artery, which is down here in the groin, a little bit harder to find, um, but it's definitely a place to start. You can always put your head on their chest and listen that way. Um, if they are not, they appear to be blue, there's no breathing, there's no talking, and there's no heartbeat, we immediately are gonna jump right into CPR. I recommend getting a CPR certification. Um, it's super helpful. You never know when you might come across any type of scene, an accident, um, a choking, a drowning, anything, not only just in the wilderness, but in life in general. Um, so CPR, First, you're going to check for scene safety. You're going to make sure that person is does not have a pulse. Doing CPR on somebody with a pulse can cause damage and ischemia to that cardiac tissue. So always, always, always take the 10 full seconds to make sure that they do or do not have a pulse. Um, always shake, make sure that they're not just not unconscious and you're not missing those signs of breathing and circulation. Um, you actually, you 100% know that that person does not have a heartbeat. We are going to go right into CPR. So CPR... Trying is better than not trying. Bystander CPR has some of the best outcomes in, in medical science whatsoever. So if somebody goes down, the sooner CPR started, even if it's slightly ineffective, is better than no CPR. So CPR, pretty simple. Um, you're gonna take your hands, interlace them like this or like this. I tend to just do whatever is more comfortable based on the positioning of the patient. Um, so it's very easy. So we're gonna take the butt of our palm here and we're gonna place it directly in between the breast tissue or the chest, directly over the heart, and we're gonna push down. You're gonna push down pretty hard. So you always wanna be straight armed and you're gonna wanna push, 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 push. It's hard. Sometimes you feel like you might be going too hard. You want to see the chest go in two inches, um, a little bit more. Okay. Um, you're going to feel really anxious when this is happening. So just try to stay calm and focused. Okay. You want the 
chest to go down two inches, which is mimicking how the chest or how the heart beats inside. Um, if you hear some crunching, it's okay. That can happen. You're going to have some ribs and some cartilage separating from the trauma to the chest. It's still better than not doing CPR in general. Um, you're going to want to shoot for 100 to 120 pumps per minute. That is simulating the heartbeat, which 100 to 100 beats per minute is good. Um, the song that they always taught us is staying alive. So, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, staying alive, staying alive. If you continue to do that, you're going to hit 100 beats a minute, okay? Um, and if there's someone else around you, have them kind of time it out for you as well, just to kind of make sure you're doing it um, effectively, okay? And also ask them, does it look like I'm going far enough? And so on and so forth. Um, every two minutes, you're going to want to check for a pulse. If they have a pulse, then you can stop CPR. If they do not have a pulse, resume CPR. Take that 10 seconds, check for that pulse. They don't, they don't have it, continue CPR. If you and a buddy are there together, you're gonna wanna alternate. You're gonna get very, very tired from this very quickly. And if no one else is there, continue to do your best for as long as you can and hope that someone comes or that help has already been called, okay? Um, that's why they say never kind of go out on your own. Um, I know we've all done it and we're not judging anyone here, um, but you know, it's always better to have a buddy in case something happens. So we're gonna talk about rescue breathing real quick. Um, it is optional. If you don't know the person you're performing CPR on, a lot of people don't feel comfortable placing their mouth over the other person's mouth. Um, in hospital settings, we have masks with a, ba with a, ba excuse me, a bag valve. Um, so we don't have to do that anymore. Um, but if you feel comfortable, you are more than welcome. Um, more importantly with CPR, we wanna keep the oxygenated blood or what little of oxygenated blood we have continuing to circuit, circulate through the bloodstream. Right now, we're trying to keep your brain, your kidneys, your heart, your lungs alive. We're trying to keep your vital organs, at least give them whatever oxygen might be in that blood. So we're gonna to continue to do that. Rescue breathing is fairly simple. Um, you're going to tilt the head back. As long as you don't see any neck trauma, drainage from the ears, eyes, nose, mouth, or any obvious trauma to the neck, it is okay to maneuver the neck to do this rescue breathing. So to promote an open airway, you're gonna tilt the head back and you're gonna thrust the jaw forward. So a lot of that is just pushing up under the jaw and helping to open the airway. You're gonna place your mouth over their mouth, pinch their nose shut, and you are going to blow in. You're going to watch for the chest to rise. Um, like I said, it's not, right now we're just more focused on circulating the blood. The rescue breathing, if you want to do that, um, is definitely an option if you feel comfortable. Now we're going to talk about CPR in children and infants. God forbid this is something that does have to happen uh, with a child. So anything over an infant to someone that you deem to be an adult-sized um, child, like teenagers, teenagers, we're going to use one hand and the palm of that, and we're going to push down like this with one hand, okay? On the infant, in the absolute traumatizing and terrible event that you come across an infant that is no longer breathing or has no heartbeat, you are going to take two fingers and you are going to push down one and a half inches. On the child, you're also going to aim for two inches, but on the infant, it's two inches and you're going to still shoot for that 100 to 120 beats per minute, okay? Um, and like I said, if you have a partner, definitely switch out because you will become very tired. Okay, any questions on CPR from you guys before I move on? I know it's a very, very, very quick overview, um, but it's something that you come across the scene, they don't have a pulse, you can at least try your best. Um, the last thing I'm going to touch on, like I said before, is bystander CPR is known to improve outcomes for people that are in cardiac arrest. Um, next, we're going to move into bleeding. Um, this is a very common thing that could happen when you're on trail um, because there's always places to fall, scrape, or cut yourselves on. Um, in the event um, that you come across someone bleeding or yourself is bleeding, there are two things to identify. Is it venous bleeding or is it arterial bleeding? Venous bleeding is less lethal, but also something that should be taken care of. And then we also have arterial bleeding, and that is something that you will die from if it is not controlled. Um, arterial bleeding is your artery, which is the highway of your blood vessels. Um, it carries high volume and high pressurized blood to different parts of your body. So that is going to look like, say you have an arterial bleed here, you're gonna notice spurts of blood coming out with each heartbeat, boom, boom. Boom. It might not shoot across the room. It might not be a Alfred, Hitch Alfred Hitchcock movie, but you're going to notice it coming out with the beats of the heart. 
Um, that is very important. We'll talk about tourniqueting, but real quick, we'll go back to venous bleeding. Um, it's going to be a more of an oozing, maybe a darker color blood. It can be bright though. So don't think that that's the only characteristic. It's going to be more of a trickle or an oozing. Um, the number one thing we do for that is we're going to compress that bandage and we're going to keep it dressed. So let's say we have some bleeding here. You're going to just take a piece of cloth, the cleanest thing you have, and you're going to put it over the wound and you're just going to put pressure. Um, so say you notice some blood coming through that bandage, put another bandage on. We don't take bandages off when we have bleeding. We put another one on and we apply pressure. Continue to apply pressure and only checking to see if that bandage is less saturated. If it continues to bleed, continue to put bandages on and try holding more pressure. Uh, the reason why we don't remove bandages is because there's healing going on immediately in a wound. Um, and the minute you pull off that bandage, you're going to pull off some of the red blood cells that are clotting in there. Okay, so it's important to just keep it bandaged. And when we get to the hospital, um, they'll be able to take it off and, and you know, assess the damage. Um, we don't ever want to double check. It's bleeding, just keep the bandage on, okay? Um, for arterial bleeding, we are also going to want to try to apply pressure. Hold that on. Don't ever let that pressure go. With venous bleeding, eventually it will stop. Um, sometimes it can take up to six to eight hours for that venous bleeding to stop. Arterial bleeding, you're never going to take pressure off. Um, in the event that you need to prep the, the person for transport and this isn't working, the pressure's not working, we're holding pressure, that's when we move on to a tourniquet. So you're going to take any type of clothing. I'm going to use a buff. You could use a shoelace. You could use a part of a shirt. Um, you are going to wrap that around. Say the wound is here. Mostly you're going to see like um, arterial bleeding on the arms, legs. Um, it's not uncommon to see head or neck. Obviously there's nothing more we can do for that other than just apply pressure. So you're going to take whatever piece of clothing you can fashion into a band and you are going to take a stick, a trekking pole, I don't care, whatever you have, you're just going to stick it in there and you are going to twist this bad boy. Now I'm not going to twist it that hard because I don't have arterial bleeding and I don't need it. So you're going to twist it until that person is screaming, ow, 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 that hurts. You're going to keep twisting it and keep twisting it and keep twisting it until you notice that blood flow is decreasing. Your, that blood that's coming out is far less than it was before. And you're going to keep twisting and then you're going to find a way to fashion this or fasten this to the arm um, to make sure that this stays tight. We do not take this tourniquet off until the medical professionals take that person to a hospital or wherever. We do not touch it once the tourniquet is on. So we can tourniquet and then we can also do a pressure bandage. Um, a lot of times you might also have to just hold pressure yourself if you can't. Um, the, the tighter the better. Um, of course, it could also, it could always cut off blood flow to that area, which is what our purpose is. Um, so we're not going to worry about the ischemia or the things that can happen with that. We're going to worry about stopping the blood and saving a life. Okay. Um, so you're going to put the tourniquet on. You can do a pressure bandage, call 911. Um, another type of wound that I'll just touch briefly on, which should not um, be something that anyone ever sees, um, but those are called sucking chest wounds. And a sucking chest wound is when a person is impaled, through the rib, through the um, pleural cavity, or through the lung, which once you have a hole in that area, the lung deflates. The lung does not want to um, take in oxygen. Um, if it's through the lung, then, you know, or if it's just through the pleural area, um, or am I thinking pleural space? Yeah, I don't know what I'm thinking. Um, the best thing to do is we're going to bandage that area. Um, what I would use is like a granola wrapper, um, a piece of tape, something that can actually adhere and close that hole so that person can promote breathing. Um, <clears throat> and with, you know, with that, it's just any type of impalement. They're going to say like, I can't breathe. I can't, I can't take a full breath. And that's when you know they might have a sucking chest wound. Um, you're just going to cover that with some type of occlusive airtight bandage and promote allowing that lung kind of a suction to open and expand. Okay. Um, tape, granola bar, anything plastic that can like really be stuck down is what I would recommend. Um, any questions on bleeding? It's pretty simple. Apply pressure tourniquet if needed. Somebody asked if I had any recommendations on tourniquets. Um, they make combat tourniquets that you can get on Amazon for about $13. They're super lightweight. They probably weigh about as much as the stick. Um, so if that's something, if you're going to be doing a high risk activity, climbing, or, you know, you're going to be doing something that you will be in a higher risk of having some type of bleeding, which you never know. No one, I don't, I don't think anyone goes out planning <laughs> to be, come back bleeding, um, but you can definitely pack one out. Um, the shoelace cloth method with a stick is also, you know, something that can help save a life. So, um, but Amazon does have lightweight combat tourniquets that you can get for like $13. Um, 
Okay, so we're going to move on to rhabdi rhabdomyolysis, um, which is very common in ultra runners, endur endurance athletes, as well as um, backpackers, through hikers, the people that, you know, we are. Um, Anish Heather Anderson touches on this in her book, Mud Rocks Blazes, I believe it's called. And she almost develops rhabdomyolysis. Um, so what is rhabdo um, is what we call it. And it is from intense working out or over exercising your muscles those muscles start to break down and they break down into something called myoglobin well those myoglobin they travel through your body and your kidney filters everything out of your body so that myoglobin goes into your kidney and it causes some um, it causes your kidneys to not be very happy so what happens is you're going to notice some bright red urine. It's gonna look like you're bleeding. Um, it's gonna, it could be brown, it could be tinged. You're also gonna notice tenderness, soreness, fatigue, muscle swelling in um, you know the muscles that you're using for your legs, so let's say that. Not always does it indicate, um, not always do these symptoms indicate what's going on, um, but if you have all these symptoms, there's a chance you might have rhabdo. Um, the number one thing for rhabdo is stop quit, um, take a rest. Um, you're going to want to treat with lots and lots and lots of fluids and a ton of electrolytes. So get that Propel, get that liquid IV, get that Mio, start chugging water. Um, also, you're probably going to want to go into an urgent care or a medical facility to make sure that your kidney damage is reversible. The key to this is, you know, take your time working out your body. Rhabdo can be preventable, but in some time, in some instances, it just happens. Um, so yeah, just take it easy. And if you start noticing these signs, take a break. Pathophys, yeah. Um, man, I always used to look at my nursing instructors and say, I don't know how they teach this, but having been a nurse for four-ish, how long, four years or five years, it just now comes as second nature. But if I'm, if I'm using terms that you guys don't understand, please let me know and I can try to break it down. As nurses, sometimes we forget not everyone knows the medical terminology that I'm using. Um, so with rhabdo, you know, treat with lots of fluids, go to an urgent care, get off trail, rest, Water, 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 water. You want to flush your kidneys out. Flush that myoglobin out, okay? Your kidneys love water. They love hydration, so give them what they're asking for, okay? Next, we're going to move on to breaks and sprains. These are actually somewhat similar. It is trauma to um, either a bone, a muscle, or a tendon, um, or in some instances, all of those things, um, some connected tissue or muscle muscles. So we'll talk about breaks first. Um, breaks can be one of two things an open or closed break a closed break means that it breaks a bone breaks inside but there's no opening there's no cut there's no opening there's no bleeding it's all inside um you do have a disfigurement or sometimes it just feels like things aren't working properly you have some grinding um and then you have an open fracture which is a little bit more high risk that is when the bone or when you fall it opens um introducing air and bacteria to that break. So once a break is open and it's now open into that cavity of the body, um, we have a higher risk of infection um, and bugs getting in there, not bugs, but you know, bacteria getting in there and increasing risk for um, infection. So in the event that happens, try to put some clean cloth over top of that. Um, and we'll talk about stabilizing, but first I wanna talk about sprains because we're gonna stabilize in a very similar way here. Um, Sprains, sometimes they feel just like a break or sometimes they hurt more um, because you're having a lot more moving parts kind of traumatized in that. Um, they, you know, we're gonna treat those pretty much the same way. We're gonna splint and stabilize with them. Um, so splinting, let's say we have a broken bone. We're just gonna use my arm because that's what, what's right here. You're gonna wanna take a stick or something rigid and hard and you're gonna place that on a safe, non-disfigured part. You're not gonna wanna try to put this down on the broken, the part of the bone that's sticking up. Put it along a non-traumatized part of the body and wrap that baby with a bandage, a cut a shirt up, wrap it with a shirt, a buff, whatever you can to just keep that um, body part immobilized. Now say you have like a multi-fracture or you have something going on on the entire arm. Let's say you fell off something and now you have a humerus and um, ulnar fracture here. You're gonna wanna stabilize the entire thing with one stable object if possible. Um, I would say sticks are probably going to be your best bet because they're lightweight and they're rigid and they're easy to kind of find straight ones. Um, so you're going to stabilize that. Um, also with sprains, you're gonna try to bandage and put some pressure on there. So to help with the swelling. Um, yeah, someone says immobilize with hiking poles, um, both above. So if you have an elbow fracture, you can, um, you're going to want to stabilize, um, through the joint here. Okay. Um, yeah, you're going to want to stabilize both areas and also it's not going to hurt to stabilize more. Um, it's only going to cause issues if you stabilize less or not enough. So 
when in doubt, just like stabilize as much as you can, okay? Um, let's see where we're at here. Oh, so with sprains, you're going to want to do some pressure help to help um, reduce inflammation. With a break, you're not going to want to pressure bandage that um, just because there's trauma going in there. And we don't want to mess with any of the, the broken parts um, that are in there. We just want to stabilize that and let a medical professional get that back in alignment. Okay. With a sprain, like I said, if you don't know what you have, just do your best to judgment. Um, let's see you sprain your ankle. Um, as far as you know, it's a sprain wrapping with an AC bandage or a buff is going to be the move here. Um, also, we're going to treat with NSAIDs. For both of these, we can use NSAIDs. We have our Tylenol and our ibuprofen, which is what most people on trail have. Um, I'll talk briefly about the difference between ibuprofen and Tylenol and when you should or should not take those. Um, so ibuprofen is an anti-inflammatory and um, a pain reliever. Then we have Tylenol, which is just a pain reliever. Um, when we would use Tylenol and not ibuprofen, so ibuprofen is great for helping reduce inflammation and swelling. Yeah, Tylenol is not an NSAID. Sorry, it's a pain reliever. You're right. Just totally spaced on that. Um, Tylenol is just a pain reliever. Um, so with ibuprofen, we, that gives us some anti-inflammatory. It's going to help reduce swelling, and it's also going to help um, reduce our pain. Tylenol does not reduce swelling. It is simply a pain reliever. Now, the reason when you would take Tylenol and not our um, ibuprofen is let's say we have an increased risk of bleeding. Okay, so let's say we have a, an open fracture that is bleeding pretty heavily. Um, ibuprofen can, in some clinical indications, in promote bleeding or decrease like blood clotting. Um, when I worked as a neurosurgical nurse, our patients only got Tylenol and you know narcotics because ibuprofen could in, um, could cause brain bleeding in our in some of our patients. So that's just something to keep in mind. Which mostly you'll have just ibuprofen, and you know unless you're really concerned about that, you can still take ibuprofen. Um, then the last thing we're going to do, and this is with any situation, anything at all, we're going to treat for shock. Um, so shock is when we have a sudden decrease in blood flow, which could be caused from literally anything. Anything can cause shock. Literally being scared can cause shock because your blood pressure drops, you're, um, you're having that fight or flight. That's very rare. But mostly we're going to have something that happens like a broken bone, a dislocated uh, body part. Um, you can have shock from almost drowning in a lake, from almost freezing, hypothermia. Shock can really come from any situation so when you see shock we're gonna see someone that looks really really crappy pale clammy woozy um and when that happens we're gonna treat for that um so with shock we're gonna elevate the feet unless they have a suspe suspected injury to the head neck spine hips or legs at that point we want to just leave those alone if someone has a neck injury moving their neck could cause them to become a quadriplegic or lose all feeling in their lower body um, and we don't want that so if someone just you know maybe they broke their arm and they're really feeling like crap we can treat them for shock so we're going to elevate their feet we're not going to elevate their head so we're going to lay them with their legs up um, we're going to leave them lie we're going to let them move we're not going to move them around we're going to just kind of let them regain that um, blood pressure okay and if for some reason this person now um, upgrades to a pulseless um, patient, we're just going to go right into CPR. Okay. So always keep an eye out for that unresponsiveness. If somebody is not awake or not waking, always check the pulse. Okay. And always check the bleeding. Sometimes we'll think, oh, they're just sleeping or, oh, they're just tired. We always want to assess for that. Okay. All right. So next we're going to talk about compartment syndrome, which this generally comes along with your breaks and sprains, mostly breaks. Um, this is going to be very rare, but in the event that this happens, I'll give you a quick rundown of a of a technique that I've never used as a nurse. Um, but in the event that this happens, you could save someone's limb. Um, oh, someone said why they didn't know I was doing this. I posted about it on Instagram and I made a post the other day on YouTube, but you know, sometimes that stuff gets lost in translation, but all that matters is out there for people to use and they can review it. Okay. So we're going to talk about compartment syndrome. So this is when, um, inside of a body part, our pressure builds up from trauma. So we're going to say I broke my arm again because I've broken both my arms. So, you know, this is a fairly realistic scenario here. I broke my arm. I slipped and fell off um, a rock and I broke my arm. Well, um, we're trying to get ourselves off the mountain. And as time is progressing, I'm starting to feel like really crappy in this arm. Um, my hands are turning colors. Um, they're numb. They don't look very well. They're losing color. They're turning white. Um, and this is, this could indicate that there is some pressure building up in this body part, which um, is cutting off blood flow. So sometimes when there's trauma in here, um, there's a bunch of layers to our bodies. We have bone, muscle, then we have fascia. So fascia lays in between muscles and the rest of the outer layers of the, the dermis, the fat, and the skin. 
So say there's pressure building up and it's stuck under this fascia. And the fascia is kind of like, all of our body parts are kind of like encapsulated like a sausage um, where we have sacs, one around our heart, we have them around our lungs, we have them in our abdomen and our muscles also have, it's not the same tissue, um, but we also have fascia that's encasing our muscles and that's there for protection and lubrication and just to keep everything separated. You know, if you like to eat on your plate, you have different different you don't want anything touching so um that inflammation develops in that area and it starts cutting off the blood flow because it's expanding out and expanding in and the, the veins and everything and arteries are like ah like we're getting suffocated so this is when you could possibly have to do something called a fasciotomy and this is going to be super rare hopefully you'll be on the phone with ems and they can indicate whether or not this is a necessity in the chance that they're like hey we'll walk you through it it's a pretty gnarly disgusting and also <laughs> Um, traumatizing. So you're going to take a knife. It's going to be clean. Let's say it's on this arm. Okay. And you are going to take from one end of that, the part of the body that is experiencing that to the other, and you are going to cut down. You're going to cut through the dermal layers, the, the fat layers, and you're going to see a white casing outside of the muscle. You're going to cut through that as well. And that's going to relieve the pressure. And you're going to leave that. You're just going to leave it like it is until someone, that person can seek medical attention. Obviously, don't let maggots and flies in there. Um, keep it clean and away from everything else. But you could save someone's limb because in the event that that compartment syndrome is actually happening, man, you could really, you know, that could really cause some ischemia and some uh, blood flow um, reduction to that area. So that's going to be like a really, really extreme situation. But in the event that you see someone, um, it does happen. And we see that very frequently in the emergency room from breaks and stuff like that. Okay, we're gonna move on to less serious things, things that, you know, is really good common knowledge just to have in general. We're gonna talk about dehydration, the heat um, challenges, and then we're also gonna talk about cold challenges. So we're gonna talk about dehydration, which can happen in any facet of our lives. And this is just when our body is not hydrated. And, you know, as through hikers, you know, you gotta drink more water than you're excreting out. So we excrete a ton and ton of hydration through our exhalation. So if you're out in the winter and you know all that, all the steam that you're you know expelling, that is water. So we actually lose more water through that than any other part of our body through urination, sweating and all of that. Um, so that's why our mouths get dry, I believe, whenever we start getting dehydrated. So this is gonna be indicated with thirst, dark urine, you're gonna feel tired, you may feel dizzy. Um, the number one thing to do is stop, take a break, and get some fluid and electrolytes, just like rhabdo. Um, take a rest, sip water, get out of the sun. And, you know, after a few hours, if you're still not feeling good, it's okay to hit that SOS button or get to an emergency room, okay? Um, dehydration can kill. Um, a lot of older folks, they end up, they can die from dehydration with complications from diarrhea. Um, it's that quick and that easy to get dehydrated. If any of you have ever had the stomach flu, you know that, you know, in a matter of days, dehydration can put you in the hospital if you're not eating and drinking and if maybe you're vomiting and diarrhea. Um, so that's the first stage of this like heat index that we're going to follow. Next is heat exhaustion. It is more extreme, but it's also something that can be treated in the field. Okay. So this is going to be indicated with headaches, dizziness, fainting. You're going to feel cold and clammy which is kind of weird. It's a little different than um, the other thing we're gonna talk about. You might be nauseous, you might be vomiting. You're gonna feel like your heart is beating out of your chest. This is heat exhaustion. So the thing we're gonna do for this is we're gonna do fluids. We're gonna do electrolytes, all those other things. We're gonna get in the shade. We're gonna cool off, maybe hop in a water source, maybe pour some water on, let that breeze kind of chill that water on you. Um, we're gonna remove tight clothing. Okay, that's just gonna help promote like getting everything that's hot off of you. Um, you're going to want to take a break, relax. Okay. Yeah. Confusion. Yeah. If you're with somebody and they start acting a little funky, you know, and they've been, you know, having these other symptoms then there's a good chance that they could have heat exhaustion. Um, this is something that can be treated, you know, on trail, but take a break. No one's going to yell at you or be mad at you for taking care of yourself. Okay. Um, then we have the third um, part of this heat index and that is heat stroke. This is a medical emergency. This is where this person is going to need emergency medical services hundred percent. Okay. And we're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. You can also have cramping yeah, with um, the heat exhaustion. So heat stroke is they're severely confused. They're delirious. They might be unconscious. They're no longer sweating. Their skin is dry, crusty. Um, they feel hot to the touch. Um, their heart rate is whew, pounding. It is boom, 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 boom. Okay. Um, I know we don't have thermometers, but it's indicated with a temperature over 104, which is very high. Okay. We don't ever want it to be that high. 
Um, at this point, we don't want to give any cold drinks. If they're conscious, we want to give them mediocrely um, tepid, like completely just water. No soda, no beer, no electrolytes, just water. Everything else can cause severe cramping in the person with heat stroke. Um, if, like I said, once you once they're into this phase, it's just call 911. Um, they're going to need medical attention. They're going to need IV access. They're going to need intravenous fluids and electrolytes, okay? Um, the key to, to preventing heat stroke is just prevent heat exhaustion and prevent dehydration, okay? Uh, yeah, and someone's saying that it happens very quick. You could feel kind of dehydrated today, go to sleep, wake up tomorrow, have a hot day, and need, maybe you're 20 miles from the next water source. And in those 20 miles, you could literally go from dehydration to heat stroke. So it's very important that you know, you are aware of your body and understand when you're feeling dehydrated or feeling a little sluggish, um, you know, and the number one thing that we talk about when it comes to hydrating yourself is a lot of people, they get to water sources and they just chug, 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 chug. Well, chugging water is okay, but it's not going to promote fully hydrating yourself. So your kidneys can only filter so much at a time. So whenever you are chugging water, your body's going to, um, absorb whatever it can, but it's going to just excrete out the rest okay it takes time to absorb water um so by just chugging water you're not going to fully hydrate yourself take small sips of water frequently every couple of minutes take a sip of water two sips three sips of water okay that's the best way to prevent all three of these scenarios from happening also um electrolytes we have our liquid iv it's three bottles worth of water of electrolytes we have propel we have meal we have just plain old dang old cow water from the pond okay whatever you got to do stay hydrated so now we're gonna move on to the cold side, which not my favorite because I hate being cold and I hate hiking and doing all that stuff in the winter. So we're gonna talk about frostbite. This isn't a huge threat, but it's very, very uncomfortable when it does happen. So you're gonna feel frostbite because it's generally a part of your body that is uncovered or um, like not covered enough. It's gonna be cold, numb. Your skin's gonna look waxy. Um, and if you've ever Googled like, um, if you've ever seen like any of those Everest movies or documentaries, you'll see that it's like kind of looks like a balloon and it looks like real shiny. It looks like it just doesn't look good. Um, it can also turn white. Your hands are going to lose all color. Um, the number one thing for this is cover up. Um, you can do a warm soak. Be careful with this because if you boil up some water and you stick your hand in it, you're not going to be able to feel it because it's going to be numb. And you could now burn your hand, which you don't want frostbite and a second degree burn. Um, so the key to that is just make sure that you're using tepid warm water, just enough to kind of promote circulation back into those digits or toes or nose or whatever. Um, at this point, probably should go home, probably get to an urgent care as soon as possible, okay? Just to help them, because a lot of times, um, sometimes frostbite gets blisters and they just need to treat that, okay? And prevent infection. Next, we have hypothermia, which claims the lives of so many people. Um, a lot of people on Mount Washington, maybe elder folks that are just underprepared. Hypothermia is so easy to get if you're just the ever bit slightest underprepared. So if you're in 50 degree water for one hour, you can die from hypothermia. So say you're out hiking Mount Washington and it's 49 degrees and you are soaking wet. In one hour, you can develop hypothermia. And that hypothermia is going to give you shivering, slurred speech, lack of coordination. You're going to feel really, really sleepy. You're going to feel tired and you're going to want to go to sleep. And guess what? When you go to sleep, that hypothermia is not going to go away and you can die from that. So, um, and nothing works in our body when it's cold. As shown by the symptoms, you're going to feel like absolute crap. You're going to start feeling confused. You're going to think, oh, I just need to lay down. I need to lay down. So the number one thing to do is get rid of that wet clothing and get yourself in a warm sleeping bag, something dry, wrap whatever you can. It's always good to have a hiking outfit and then a sleeping outfit or a dry sleeping bag. Always want to make sure you have something dry to wrap yourself in. Um, you can drink warm liquids if you're coherent enough. Um, whatever you can to kind of heat that core of your body temperature up because it's probably pretty low. Um, Call 911. At this point, if you're slurred speech and you're drowsy and you're sleepy, call 911, okay? It's not worth um, just saying, hopefully I wake up tomorrow, okay? Um, yeah, in 32, in freezing temperatures, you can die within 10 minutes from hypothermia. If you're, if you're like in just a t-shirt and clothes and like a freak storm comes in, you can die in like 10 minutes. So it's really important just, it's better to carry more and stay warm than freeze to death. Oh my gosh, how terrible would that be? All right, someone wanted me to touch on altitude sickness. 
I've never been, like the highest altitude I've ever been was 12,000 feet for a little day hike in Colorado. Um, but we're going to talk about it because it's very simple to understand. Um, altitude sickness is when we're higher elevations, we have less oxygen and our body is used to operating at this amount of oxygen. And then we go up higher and we have less oxygen and our body's kind of stressed out. Um, so the symptoms, the first symptoms you're going to notice are you're going to feel a headache. You're going to feel weak. You might feel like you're short of breath. It's tough catching your breath. Um, you might start feeling nauseous. Um, at this point, you're going to stop. You need to acclimate to whatever, whatever, um, elevation you're at. So at this point, stop and don't get any higher for 24 to 48 hours. Because if you're, say you're climbing Denali and you experience it at a certain um, elevation, continuing up is only going to make it worse. It's not going to go away by toughing it out. Okay. Altitude sickness. And people say like, ha ha, like you only made it this far. Don't, don't do that. Okay. All of our bodies are different. And by pushing your body with altitude sickness, you're going to end up in a worse off situation, which we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about HAPE and ACE, which is high altitude pulmonary edema and then high altitude cerebral edema. So this is when we've missed those warning signs of altitude sickness or we're climbing Mount Everest and we're acclimating, but it's still an opportunity. This is still an option of something that can happen. This is still a risk factor. So when we're even higher and the oxygen is even lower, um, our lungs and our brain, they really need oxygen, right? So right now the oxygen is kind of low and they start swelling because it's like, ah, we don't have enough oxygen. Like we're going to be, we're in, we're inflamed. And you know, if you've ever, you know, got a burn, you notice that it gets inflammation. So whenever we have trauma to a body part, our body sends fluids, electrolytes, good things, fats, proteins, all to that area, which causes swelling. So if you didn't know what swelling is from, it's because when we have trauma, our body sends a bunch of good stuff to try to promote healing. And that's what swelling is. So our brain starts swelling, which inside a hard skull, your brain only has so far to swell before it's really not okay. Same with your lungs. Like we have a hard rib cage and our lungs can only go so far before that edema starts affecting that. So if you start noticing pulmonary or cerebral edema, we're looking at like severe confusion. We're looking at um, inability to focus, stay awake, um, the headache, nausea, everything is getting worse. Immediately turn around and go back down. Okay, you wanna descend at least 3000 feet. These are emergencies. Um, you don't want your brain to be swollen ever. Um, so these are emergencies. Go down 3,000 feet and also call 911. Um, at this point, looks like your hike is probably over. Um, you're probably not going to make it to that summit and just be thankful you're alive. Okay. Next, we're going to touch. We're getting down to like the real, the real easy stuff here and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. So we're going to talk about blisters, which plagues all of us. Um, blisters, the key to blisters is preventing blisters. Once you get one, they're pretty much just, you know, they're just that devil on your shoulder, just like taunting you. Um, a lot of people say pop versus don't pop. So we're going to talk about when to pop a blister and when to leave that, leave that lady lie. Okay. So you notice a blister or a hot spot. First of all, when you have a hot spot, the key to that is covering it to prevent that rubbing from happening and getting worse. If you can catch a hot spot, you're in the clear. Whenever I start feeling any hot spots, I take my socks off, I put on some Leuco tape or a Band-Aid, and I change my socks, okay? Maybe I'll let my feet air out or whatever is going on. I'll try to do the opposite. If they're dry and crusty, maybe um, <laughs> this person, Michael B. said he majored in blister prevention. We love it. We love it. Write us a book. Um, but yeah, hot spots, immediately start covering those and get rid of whatever is happening in your foot um, and try to correct that. If it's dirt, if it's grime, if it's wet, do the opposite, Okay. So if we get to the point where it's now blister, we didn't listen to ourselves. And when do we pop it? So in theory, you should never pop a blister because the whole reason for that blister is, like I said, our body's sending some good juice there, right? Yeah, Zachary Holbar, Holbear says, prevent friction. Yeah, what if your heel is rubbing on your shoe, like tighten your shoe, figure out what's causing that or put a layer of protection between um, your foot and your shoe, okay? So now we have a blister and there's fluid in it and, you know, we're not supposed to pop that. But as hikers, sometimes we get blisters in places that we, we have to pop because say it's on the bottom of our foot and by walking on that blister, it's causing us to compensate, which is causing us ankle pain, which is causing us knee, hip, and back pain. So there are times when, yes, you'll have to pop a blister and you're going to have to make that decision for yourself when the blister becomes, you know, important to pop. So whenever you have a blister that needs popped, you're going to want to take a clean needle, a pin, whatever you can, um, a lot of times we use the tip of our knives, which is kind of big. That can cause some more trauma to the area. So I would say pack out a needle. It's a very, very, very lightweight. Um, and oh yeah, this um, Pat says moleskin. I put a moleskin on a blister on the OCT and it ugh, saved my toe. 
Okay, so we're gonna pop the blister, a nice clean needle, make sure it's sterilized, make sure you have hand sanitizer or burn it with a knife or burn it with a lighter, just get all the germs off of it and you're gonna pierce through the blister, squeeze it out, and then what I do when I pop a blister is I immediately put Neosporin on it and I wrap it tightly with a Band-Aid um, to prevent that blister from filling back up again. A lot of times people put dental floss through and that prevents that hole from closing up to prevent it from filling back up with fluid. Um, you can do whatever, Whatever works for you guys. I'm not the blister police, but I'm just telling you what I do. I pop that bad boy and then I put some Neosporin on and I tight wrap it with a band-aid to prevent that blister from developing again. It works for me. I rarely get blisters, uh, but in the off chance that I do, that's what I do with them. And also figure out why you're getting blisters. Like I said, if it's your shoe, people say like, oh, I've just had blisters for 500 miles. Maybe get new shoes or new socks. But like I said, it's up to you, okay? So we're gonna move on to the critters. Um, not my favorite thing to talk about, but also important because we share our trails with a lot of critters, okay? So we're going to talk about ticks. Um, ticks are, you know, the the mean... <laughs> Your mic needs some fur, I hear. When... Yeah, it's just my cell phone. Sorry. It's a little windy here today. I'm sorry. Um, I don't have any, like, special... I'm not using any, like, special gear or anything. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about ticks. Um, the key to ticks are daily tick checks. It does feel like it's getting windy. So I'll try to finish up quickly here. Daily checks. Um, the way that we get diseases from ticks are um, 24 to 48 hours after a tick latches onto you. So it's going to bite onto you. 24 to 48 hours, that tick is just going to be stuck in your blood. And they're going to get to a point where it's now filled with your blood. At that point, that is when the blood barrier is like, osmo like osmolized. So, you know, if you know what osmosis is, it's like when you have two things connected and it just starts once they're the pressure is equal they just start freely exchanging so that's my best way to um explain like what ticks do so once they get once they're full then they can start giving you their nasty 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 bugs their nasty germs their Lyme disease and whatever that thing that causes um allergy to red meat like hello ticks like you're just like the spawn of some very dark evil sinister stuff so in the event that you find a tick on you every 24 hours, because you know that if you check every 24 hours, that tick couldn't possibly be on you long enough to give you Lyme's disease or whatever that meat allergy um, disease is. Um, so daily checks, check in your hair, check your armpits. They love to hang out where like elastic or waistbands or sock lines or in your groin. Guys, check your balls, okay? Ticks like to hang out there. Um, and in the event you see a tick, and it is latched on, its head is now inside of you, there's a very easy way to get rid of them. A lot of people have like those tick combs that they use. You can have those, absolutely. I'm sure they made them for a reason. Um, but what I do is I take tweezers and you grab to the very base of the tick, as close to the skin as you can get, and you just pull outwards, okay? In the event that the head dislodges or a part of the head is in there, all you gotta do is just clean it real good and let your body heal that, okay? Your body will get rid of it. And if you notice an infection, then it's time to go to the doctor, okay? Um, do, do, do. And then also say you catch a tick and you don't know when it could have latched onto you. It looks big and fat. You pull it out um, and watch for signs of Lyme disease. You're going to notice increased fatigue and a bullseye rash. Neither of those always happen. Sometimes it can be months before you exude symptoms, but it's usually like within a few weeks. Um, some people never get the rash um, and the rash might not be located where the tick bit you. It could be anywhere. At that point, you're going to want to go to the doctor. Sometimes they give ceftriaxone, sometimes they give doxycycline, whatever your doctor indicates for that, um, you know, you're going to want to take that immediately. So, um, okay, we're going to talk about spidey bites because those are also nasty. Um, in our country, we have two venomous spiders, only two that can really, really hurt you, and that is the brown recluse and the black widow. Okay, someone says take doxycycline 200 milligrams one time dose. So yeah, if you notice a tick bites you, you could take that prophylactically. Um, always do that under the supervision of a doctor. I'm not going to tell you to take anything that's not currently prescribed to you, but it is a recommendation. So someone somewhere said it, and I'm just going to repeat that information. You do with it whatever you want. Um, as a nurse, I can't give like medical advice on taking medications unless it's prescribed by the doctor. So do whatever your doctor tells you, okay? All right, so we're moving on to spider bites. We have the brown recluse and the black widow. Um, a lot of times these spider bites aren't going to really harm you too badly, depending on where the bite is and how allergic you are or um, sensitive you are to that 
um, spider's venom. Um, you're probably going to develop a rash or um, swelling, or you might get like some brownish black coloring to your skin. Um, brown recluse venom does cause tissue to die. So you might have to go to the hospital and get a washout or have them kind of remove some of that yucky dead tissue. Um, black widows can make you feel really crappy and sick. Uh, at that point, just monitor the spider bite. And when you get to that point, you can always call 911 or always go off trail to an urgent care. Um, in the event that you have a spider bite or any type of bite that is swollen and doesn't look great, just clean it. Put some Neosporin on it, antibiotic cream. Um, if you start feeling that you cannot breathe or you're showing signs of infection, which is like purulent drainage, pus coming out of the site, maybe you feel body aches, fever, you're feeling sick, you could have gotten an infection. Bugs are gross. They carry things and they give us bacteria and you can get an infection from anything. You can get infection from breathing in the wrong piece of grass. Like you can get an infection from stubbing your toe. You can get an infection from rubbing your eye. Like infections can happen all the time. Yeah, we're going to talk about MRSA. Not a good, not a fun bug, okay? Um, if you can't breathe and you are having an allergic reaction, call 911, okay? Next, we're going to move on to the slithery snakes because, ew. Um, I was Googling how many types of venomous snakes there are in our country, and there's a lot. So I'm not even, I didn't, not even going to tell you because it kind of skeeved me out a little bit here. But um, there's a lot of poisonous snakes. The key to getting, if you're bit by a snake, identify that snake. Um, one trick that someone told me, and I don't know if this is 100% accurate, but if a snake's eyes are round or their pupils are round, then they're non-venomous. And if their eyes are like a cat where it's like the, like the slit opening, um, then they could be venomous. Also, if they have a rattle, they're probably venomous. Um, and then there's also like a diamond or what are they called? Copper, copper, copperheads, cotton mouths. They look really similar to like the corn snake or a youthful brown, uh, youthful black snake. So every snake I see, I just assume that it's like a dangerous snake. And I've been having recently dreams about like tail is blunt equals venom. I have no idea. I've only seen a few rattlesnakes and I've never seen any of the, of these other crazy ass venomous snakes that are out there. Um, someone said I had a friend get bitten by a desert recluse and had to use peroxide and squeeze it to get the pus out. It was fine after a week. See, a lot of the times we're just, we, we hear the worst case scenarios on the news and on like social media and stuff. And like a lot of times these things are easily treated on trail. Um, so say you get bit by a snake. The key is to identify it. Was that a rattlesnake? Was it a coral snake? Was it a pit viper? Like at that point, you're probably going to want to get off trail and get to the nearest emergency room. Not all emergency rooms carry anti-venom. Um, depending on where you are, you could be flown hundreds of miles to receive that anti-venom. So the key is to stay away from those, uh, liz those devil lizards. Okay. Um, stay away from them. Um, but in the event you are bit by one, there's a few things we can do. Say the snake bites you and you can't ID it and you're not sure, call 911 and splint that. So a snake bites you on the arm, splint it for immobilization. Now, what that does is it prevents your body from moving that extremity or moving that body part. And when we move it, it promotes absorption into of that venom into our tissue. So the less we use it, the less it just like, and they always say like, stay calm because like if your heart beats faster, I don't know if that's true, but like the more anxious you are, the quicker the venom is absorbed, which I don't know if that's scientifically Act. But in the event that it is, let's just stay calm. Um, there's also two techniques to preventing um, venom from uh, being absorbed. It is called the pressure immobilization technique and the constriction band. So pressure immobilization is you're going to want to wrap that body part really tight, um, as tight as you can, and that will prevent the venom from being absorbed up into the body part. Um, and then we also have the constriction band. So it's kind of like a tourniquet, but not as tight. So you're going to put it on here. Um, and you're going to want to be able to fit two fingers in there. And that's just going to help prevent the venom from absorbing up into the body. Okay. Someone says a water moccasin looks like a water banded snake. Most venomous snakes bite happen to people that were harassing the snake. So yeah, just leave them alone, man. Let them leave the snakes alone. Um, so yeah, in the event that you can't identify a snake, it's not worth risking whether or not it was a rattlesnake or a coral snake or a pit viper. It just call 911. Go to urgent care so that way they can, uh, um, or go to the hospital so they can admit you and monitor that snake bite. Um, the last thing I want to talk about before we talk about what should be in your first aid kit is rabies. So any animal can have rabies, especially mammals, bats. Um, I'm not sure if like lizards, repti like reptiles and frogs can carry rabies. I'm obviously not a rabies specialist. Um, it's not really my thing, but I've dealt with people that have been bit by animals that have rabies or that they are not sure if they had rabies. Um, 
So little disclaimer here is bats carry rabies. And a lot of times if you wake up with a bat in your house or you wake up somewhere where a bat is flying around you, there's likelihood that it could have bit you because most bats, you cannot feel a bat bite and they carry rabies without exuding rabies like symptoms. So if you wake up and there's a bat around you or your dead bat next to you, um, it's not a bad idea just to go and get the rabies series. The rabies series is crappy. You have to get like a series of three or four rabies um, shots and they're not very fun. Um, so you're always going to keep an eye out for wild animals. Stay away. Give them space. Don't provoke any animal ever. Even if it's someone's pet, just leave it be. We love animals. Let them just live. Um, but in the event you get bit by an animal, you're going to want to keep it clean. Watch for infection. Um, someone said, does that apply in the UK? I'm not sure. Bats are bats. So I don't know. But I know here in the US, when people come into the hospital, um, when they find a bat in their house, they just get vaccinated. So I maybe research that and let me know. Um, so an animal bites you, keep it clean. Watch for infection. Um, and if you feel like there was a rabid skunk on the Arizona Trail and... Um, you know, people ended up killing it after it tried to attack them. Um, so had they got bitten, you know, they would, you know, had to have gotten the rabies shots. Um, the only way to test for rabies in any animal or person is to chop the head off and check for rabies in the brain, according to my sister, who's a veterinarian technician. Um, so if you're concerned if the animal is acting funky, just stay away from it. Um, and even if it's not acting funky, just stay away from it. Uh, so yeah, rabies cannot, can be kind of crappy and not very fun. Um, so yeah. Uh, then the last thing I'm going to talk about is what should be in your first aid kit. Uh, my first aid kit is literally some band-aids, neosporin, and some leuco tape. Um, just cause most of my issues involve hot spots on my feet or chafe. Um, neosporin can be great for chafe. Um, also when I have chafe, I throw aquaphor in my pack I, at the next town and it literally heals everything. Um, aquaphor is amazing for dry skin. You can put it all over your body. It's water-based so it's not going to be like sticky like petroleum i got chafe on the azt gnarly stuff and i just threw some aquaphor on it and i was literally healed overnight um so do you guys have so yeah your first aid kit you just have to decide um don't pack your fears most of you 99.9999 repeating percent are going to be fine so um in the off chance i just wanted to do this live because you never know what you're going to stumble upon the reason why i um wanted to do this was because a friend of mine had sent a post and I will get to the, the salmonella from animals. Um, the reason why I wanted to touch upon this is they sent me a post of a girl on the CDT who had a boulder fall on her and broke her leg. She hit her SOS button. And as the flight nurse was there assessing and triaging her, a, another man had been, a boulder had fell on him and he like glissaded down the mountain and they like had to rescue him. So like in the off chance that the first responders hadn't been there, that person might've had to do CPR or might've had to do like a triage first responding type situation. So um, I just think it's important because in the, in the industry that we are backpacking, kayaking, river rafting, climbing, biking, all of it has, um, risk for injury. So, um, and lastly, someone wanted me to talk about salamanders and frogs. So touching, uh, reptiles, um, they are known to carry salmonella on their skin. Um, so if you touch any lizard, animal, salamander, anything whatsoever, for one, you shouldn't leave them alone. Um, in the off chance that you do pick one up, wash or hand sanitize before you put anything near your mouth. Um, you definitely don't want salmonella. It's not fun. So, all right, guys, that is all I have. Do you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything that you think I should touch on or that I missed or that needs corrected or any just other questions whatsoever before I head, um, over to Instagram to do a live with hiker royalty in about an hour. So any questions for you guys? You are very welcome. The bill, 9999. Zach, I'm sorry. I must go. Go on over to Instagram in an hour. I'll be there. Um, just seeing that they're here in the UK, we have been, been rabies free for a while, except in small cases of about 30 bats. Interesting. So I'm saying don't put frogs on anyone. No, don't put frogs. Just leave frogs alone, okay? Um, thank you very much, TC5556 guy. Um, anything else you guys would like to add or anything else I can touch on? Can you just come with me on my next adventure? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Where are we going? Uh, thank you guys. Drinking wild water. Um, filter your water or use aquamarine tablets or whatever. Don't drink water. You can't see the dead animal or the poop upstream. Filter, filter, filter. Um, great input. Thank you guys. All right, guys. Well, um, I'll see you over on Instagram to just gossip and talk shit with Hiker Royalty in an hour. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, it means a lot to me. And I hope at least one person learned something that could maybe save a life.
So, all right, guys, until my next upcoming adventure, there'll be a gear video. But until then, this is me signing off. Have a good night, guys.